Okay, so uh, my name is Miles Stouffer, I'm from Cambridge University, uh, and I'm going to be talking about the effects of neutron radiation on nickel base alloys. So, why did I do this review? Um, so, generation 4 reactors are uh, coming closer to fruition, and these are advanced reactors with higher efficiencies, power efficiencies, and uh, higher proliferation resistance, among other uh, benefits. And nickel base have become more prominent in their designs. And it's necessary, given the uh, higher, more intense extreme environments that we're getting, higher radiation doses and higher temperatures in, in some of the designs, that we re-evaluate embrittlement in nickel base alloys. And so we're seeing higher embrittlement rates in alloys currently in operation in nuclear reactors at present uh, than initially predicted by accelerated fast reactor data. And so a comprehensive review of all this data is necessary so we can understand better how these materials are going to behave in advanced systems. Now, um, little is understood on some of the embrittlement mechanisms in these and how to prevent them. But nickel-based alloys are appealing for these because they are corrosion resistant, they've got high temperature strength, creep resistance. Um, so they're sort of in competition, really, with high chromium steels for applications in these. And so table one I've got here, we'll see the, um, the two main alloys that we're going to focus on today are alloy 600 and X750. Now alloy 600 comes in two primary um, microstructures for implantation in nuclear reactors. And one is a aust austenitic, uh, simple solid solution solid solution annealed alloy 600 and the other one is similar but with chromium carbides M23C6 on the grain boundaries and that's done for stress corrosion cracking resistance one of the concerns that you get in primary circuits in reactors don't panic if you don't know what a primary circuit is because I am going to show you X750 is similar to the um, precipitate hardened 600 uh, but you have um, gamma prime as the main precipitating species in the grains with M23C6 mainly along the grain boundaries. And they're used for springs. So why do we look at nickel base alloys and where are they used in the plant? Um, so nickel base alloys throughout the sort of nuclear history have been used almost in every area of a plant from pressure vessel heads, alloy 600 pressure vessel heads to X750 being used for fuel spacers and they're becoming more prominent in generation 4 designs in high flux regions such as fuel spaces in the pins and um, core barrels for instance alloy 600 has been used a number of times for core barrels so what's the problem with using nickel base alloys in these environments well it's the neutron radiation is a big issue because this is what's causing the embrittlement so I'll give you a quick summary of what neutron radiation is it's a radiation consisting of three neutrons these three neutrons uh, are a result of fission or fusion and these are released from the atoms and can be incorporated into other atoms to induce new isotopes which in turn can produce other radiation sources such as the release of a helium atom also known as alpha radiation. Okay. Now there are two fundamental mechanisms of irradiation embrittlement that we're going to discuss and this is the first one and they are collision cascades, which someone has already briefly discussed. But what we get is you get a primary knock-on atom. So your neutrons come in and it's bumped an atom, a bit like billiard balls. And you hit your atom and what you produce is uh, Frenkel pairs, so vacancies and interstitials. So atoms being moved from their original position. That's what you're seeing here. Green is interstitials and red are vacancies. So you're completely destroying the crystal structure here. And this is a sort of midway. As you can see, it's you know, half a picosecond, and we've already got this really extreme sort of effectively a detonation of the, uh, of the, of the material structure. But in a moment, after we've done our little rotation, you'll see what happens. So they start to anneal. So they start to recombine, and you end up with only a few point defects or some dislocation loops uh, left over at the end. So as you can see, we're going into the tens of picoseconds now. And you can see we've got a dislocation loop here, and you've got some vacancy in interstitial clusters. And it's these that affect mechanical properties of, uh, of these uh, materials <coughs> under radiation. 
The second mechanism is transmutation. And that's going to be a bit more of a focus of, of what I'm going to talk about today. And there are three fundamental um, reactions that you get in the presence of neutrons. And one is the reaction of boron-10 to produce that pesky alpha radiation. So you're producing a helium atom. And also the transmutation of nickel-59 to produce either helium or hydrogen. So what we've got here is we've got cross-section. Uh, and that's effectively the probability of a reaction occurring. And then you have the energy of your incoming neutron that causes that billiard ball effect. And you can see that for low energy neutrons, you have a very high probability of transmuting boron 10 to helium and lithium. And if we go over and look at our cross section for our nickel 59, you see that in fast neutrons, so that's known as high energy neutrons, are known as fast neutrons, uh, you can see that it's dominated by the production of hydrogen whereas low energy neutrons, also known as thermal neutrons, uh, dominate helium production. So it's very neutron spectrum specific, so different reactors will behave in different ways. And you will produce different num amounts of hydrogen and helium. And this is what both of those combined do to the material. Um, what we see, this is solution annealed alloy 600. Um, and these have been irradiated, so each atom has been displaced four to nine times from its original position in the entirety of the alloy. Uh, so I'll just briefly give you a description of these graphs. So we've got strength on, in a megapascals on our y-axis and irradiation and temper uh, test temperature on our x-axis. And what you'll see is you get hardening at lower temperatures, and that's because of that defect cluster. So you're accumul accumulating these defects, and that's inhibiting dislocation motion and making that hardened matrix. And you'll see that throughout all the temperature range, and this is a typical temperature range where some of the generation four designs are being proposed to work out, um, you'll see that we lose ductility, which is a big no-no. Just to highlight, these here are the handbook values. So this is typical yield strength when it's uh, not irradiated. And this is what you get when you're under irradiation. And this, the uh, same for the total elongation or ductility. In addition to this hardening, swelling. So, like my uh, colleague said, uh, BCC is a little bit more preferred to FCC, but we're, uh, we're stuck with uh, nickel base because of the beautiful corrosion resistance and all the other beneficial properties they have. But what you'll see, this is solution in the alloy 600 again, so no precipitates. Uh, you see that it, with increased temperature, and again this is irradiated to four to nine displacements per atom, you get an increased uh, amount of swelling, and it's really significant. We're looking at you know four percent swelling when you're running at sort of the top temperatures that some of the generation four reactors will run at. Um, I say normalize here. What I did is I took the data um, from different from different irradiations that had different numbers of helium uh, contents, and so it's been normalized to a standard helium content. So you can see really the effects of temperature on that swelling because helium is going to play a big role in, uh, in swelling. Not only that, but you get a loss in toughness. So uh, that's the x-axis, uh, the y-axis here, sorry, is toughness. Um, with the observed extension of cracks on the x-axis. And what it shows basically is you require less energy to propagate a crack uh, when it's been irradiated. So this is your non-irradiated your 7 dPa and then your 24, so we're increasing dose as we go down. And so the thing just cracks a lot easier when it's been irradiated. Again, we're sticking, we've been stuck with solution annealed alloy 600 until now. This is X750. And this is going to show the effects of boron content. So what we have here is we uh, see the loss of our final stronghold, our stress corrosion cracking resistance of nickel base alloys. It shows that with boron content, uh, which is added for hot workability in nickel base alloys, that was the original reason why they added boron. Uh, we see the boron content actually induces irradiation assisted stress corrosion cracking or at least enhances it. Uh, and you see this not only in X750, you see in alloy 625, 600 other nickel base alloys that are used in the nuclear industry. So, why does this happen? What are the mechanisms behind this? And what can we do? really to stop them. Well the reason why boron seems to do this is embrittlement of nickel base alloys results in grain boundary embrittlement. 
So you tend to get fracture at stresses much lower than you would expect along these grain boundaries. Now what boron does is it segregates to grain boundaries and this is uh, X750 uh, with two different, dif uh, two different boron heats for the same alloy and you'll see that this is a uh, secondary iron mass spectrometry image and you can see the boron segregated on what just so happened to be grain boundaries. I have to take my word for that. And you see the low boron heat, you don't get so much segregation. So I told you that boron transmutes to helium. So if it's already segregated to the grain boundaries, and when you see embrittlement under a reactor, you see grain boundary embrittlement, then it makes sense that you put those two together and you say, okay, the boron is producing helium under irradiation, and it's already segregated to the grain boundaries. So you're creating a uh, network of, of helium. And that's what we've got here. So this is X750. These were fuel spaces taken out of a CANDU reactor, it's a type of deuterium uh, reactor. And you see helium and helium uh, bubbles conglomerating, it's quite hard to see on this, but you see helium bubbles conglomerating on the grain boundary. And so you effectively, if you looked at a statistical analysis of this, you'd see a higher density of helium bubbles on the grain boundary. So they, they appear to be conglomerating which concurs with our theories of helium is inducing this grain boundary in Britain. And then you see the effect is you get this intergranular fracture surface with this sort of dimpling effect. And this is attributed to helium in Britain. So how can we stop it? Well, if helium is going to be produced by nickel in the grains and a boron on the grain boundaries, you can eliminate boron on the grain boundaries and you've solved that problem. But you've still got the helium production from the nickel in the grains. So if it's travelling, if it's diffusing to grain boundaries, why don't we just somehow try and stop it from diffusing to grain boundaries? And you can do that. And this is what we see here, is we have eta phase, eta phase, and helium is actually not only being trapped on grain boundaries, but it's being trapped on the interface of the eta phase to the matrix. And so if we can optimise materials to produce such interfaces and secondary phases, then we could prevent helium conglomeration on the, um, on the grain boundaries and stop this grain boundary in Britain. Now, how does this work? What I have here is a molecular dynamics simulation and I've simulated a phase boundary interface, this is circle, so I've got higher binding energy. And these are hydrogen atoms, these red ones, and this is actually an iron matrix, I've been a bit cheeky and I've used iron instead of nickel. But you'll see hydrogen runs around and it likes to slot into the higher binding energy sites. You can imagine a precipitate and you have a strain profile around, you have a um, coherency effect and it's thought that that is the reason why you have these sort of wells really, these traps for hydrogen. The reason why I'm showing hydrogen is because a lot of modelling has been done for hydrogen in iron, iron based materials and nickel based materials and from my investigation I've seen that there's a lot of crossover between the effects of helium and hydrogen, of course the solubility is very different but the behaviour, the fundamental kinetics, are very similar. And the ways that you can prevent hydrogen and helium prediction have a lot of crossover. So given these models in steels, how can we apply these to nickel base? And uh, this project is actually nothing to do with my PhD. My PhD is in hydrogen enrichment of steels, so thankfully there's a, there's a nice crossover. I haven't invented this. Um, and what we do in steels is that uh, I develop hydrogen vitamin resistant bearing steels and one of the ways that we do that is we produce nanoparticles distributed throughout these steels and these nanoparticles are vanadium carbides and we produce them around 10 nanometers diameter and we find that when you pump the material full of hydrogen, hydrogen is trapped along those interfaces like I showed you for helium in those. So already we've, we've seen that crossover and what you see in nickel base alloys is although it's never been conclusively evaluated you could read endless papers and get contradictory evidence all over the place uh, if, you, if you were to produce a column of people say MC carbides are good and people MC carbides are bad you will get more people saying MC carbides are good for trapping of both hydrogen and helium and so we decided that MC carbides seem to be the most appealing for producing uh, irradiation and resistant structures now notably, not obviously helium trapping and hydrogen trapping are not the only problems. Another problem is defect recombination. And so you imagine your billiard ball effect. Now if you could create sites that make it easier for those defects to recombine, those Frenkel pairs to re recombine, 
then you could reduce the overall number of point defects left over at the end of your collision cascade. And you see this in uh, oxide dispersed steels, where you have these tiny oxide nanoparticles distributed, and you see a reduced effect of irradiation with respect to hardening. So they're providing recombination sites for these Frenkel pairs. So uh, the belief is, or at least my thought is, we could use MC carbides of a nano size, similar to the way they do oxide dispersed steels, and produce these sites for recombination. So this is what I'm saying here. So this is sort of the final bit of my talk. What, uh, what I've done is uh, I've actually run the models and produced a alloy 600 based uh, material, so high nickel and about 0.18 carbon. Uh, and I have run kinetics to produce a homogeneously distributed microstructure of MC carbides throughout the grains, but with the uh, chromium carbides on the grain boundaries that are needed for stress corrosion cracking. And what you can do is you can pump these full of hydrogen, then use thermal desorption analysis, so you heat your material up, and you see the hydrogen ingress from the traps, because of course it's temperature dependent. And you can do that for helium as well, same system. Then we can mechanically test them, that hasn't been done yet. Um, and then you can actually look on the TEM and see if you get these helium bubble conglomerations around your phases. It's a bit harder to uh, look at hydrogen. You can use atom probe tomography to look at deuterium, but hydrogen is beyond the limits at the moment with respect to uh, characterization. And then hopefully someone will fund this research because, as I said, it's not actually part of my PhD. But to summarize, it's evident that new alloys are needed because the current materials in the nuclear sector just aren't up to the job or the demands of the generation four reactors. So with nickel-based alloys, with these nanoprecipitates, it offers an opportunity to develop advanced materials for these applications. And I just want to emphasize that despite people being aware of hydrogen trapping or helium trapping on these areas, it's never really been done, this sort of work. The most similar thing is oxide dispersed steels. Uh, the problem with oxide dispersed steels is they're mechanically alloyed and it's a real pain to produce these and it's not really as commercially viable. But what you can do with these alloys is vanadium carbides have a certain stability where you can cast your alloy, you can dissolve the large carbides formed upon casting and re-precipitate them to your optimum size or distribution for your microstructure. And that's what we're doing at the moment and we're, we've actually validated our first cast to, to actually prove that you can actually do this. And, uh, and that's my talk. Thanks very much. <laughs>